Our call to confession is from the 26th chapter of Matthew, verses 14 to 25. Hear now this word of God. Then one of the twelve, who was called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What will you give me if I betray him to you? They paid him 30 pieces of silver. And from that moment, he began to look for an opportunity to betray him. On the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying, where do you want us to make the preparations for you to eat the Passover? He said, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is near. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and they prepared the Passover meal. When it was evening, he took his place with the 12 and while they were eating, he said, truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. And they became greatly distressed and began to say to him one after another, surely not I, Lord. He answered, the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The son of man goes as it is written of him but woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. Judas, who betrayed him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. He replied, You have said so. Please join me as we read our prayer of confession responsively. Holy God, you know our best intentions all too well. You know our desire to be kind and honest, true to our ideals in all that we say and do. We don't want to deceive you or betray you. Sure. Holy God, you know how hard our lives are. You know about our full schedules and all the demands on our resources. It just isn't possible for us to give you more of our time and attention. Holy God, you know that we live in a broken world. Our lives are shaped by forces beyond our control. We are part of systems much bigger than we are, inheritors of problems we did not create. Holy God, you know our excuses. In truth, we have become comfortable with the way things are. In our life and in our world, even when we know they are not what you, want, what you would want, we are afraid to shake things up. We doubt that we have the power to make a difference. We do not trust you more than we trust our habits and our culture, and we lack the courage to live into our call. Holy God, despite our best intentions, we have betrayed you. I trust in you, O Lord, I say, you are my God. My hands and my hand deliver me from the hand of my enemies and persecutors. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. Friends, no matter how far we have wandered, God invites us to return. This is the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. While they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread and after blessing it, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body, broken for you. Then he took the cup and 
after giving thanks, whoops. <laughs> we still have some uh, elements of the communion to come forward here. Darren, would you mind a little entrance music as we ceremoniously bring all of this forward? Then he took the cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, drink it, all of you, for this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will never again drink the fruit of this vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Let us pray. <clears throat> oh God, creator of our wilderness world. Oh God, savior of the lost. Oh God, comforter of the sick and suffering. We give you thanks for your everlasting might. We glorify you for your covenant of mercy. For 40 days you cleansed the earth with the waters of the flood. For 40 days you illumined Moses with the words of your law. We praise you, For 40 years you fed your people with manna from heaven. We you, you became truly human in Jesus, our brother. For 40 days, with fasting and prayer, he renounced the power of the devil. We extol his life. Amen. We lament his death. Amen. We celebrate his resurrection. Amen. Transform us, O oh God, with your lively spirit. Make this food into manna for our journey, the body and the blood of your Son. Save us, Grant us, with the Ninevites, 40 days of repentance. Teach us your words of wisdom and justice. Save us, God. Renew the whole earth with baptismal grace. Save us, God. At the last, lead all your pilgrim people through our deserts to your Easter garden. To you, O oh God, creator, savior, comforter, father, son, and holy spirit, be our worship and praise, adoration and thanksgiving now and forever. Amen. Friends, this morning you are invited to come forward to the table and to receive these gifts of God, bread and cup. You can take a piece of the bread and dip it into the cup and receive uh, the cup that way by intinction. If you would prefer not to come up and have these elements. We do also have um, our sort of um, sealed and single serving communion elements and uh, Diane would be happy to bring one to you uh, and you can have that in your pew if that's more comfortable for you. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Come, all things are now ready.
And now I'd like to invite our readers to come forward. Irvin and Andre and Shernette and Emmanuel. And you can read from this side. And we'll hear what happened when the disciples got up from the table. Morning, church. The reading one, Matthew 26, 30 to 46. When they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, you will all become deserters because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Peter said to him, though all become deserters because of you, I will never desert you. Jesus said to him, truly I tell you, this very night before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to them, even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and agitated. Then he said to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and stay awake with me. And going a little further, he threw himself down on the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So you could not stay awake with me one hour? Stay awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial? The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again he went away for the second time and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, are you still sleeping and taking your rest? See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let's be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. While he was still speaking Judas, one of the twelve arrived with him was a large crowd of swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him. At once he came up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you are here to do, and then came and laid hands on Jesus and arrested him. Suddenly, one of those... But Jesus put his hand on his sword, drew it, and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father, and he will at once send me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then will the scriptures be fulfilled, which say it must happen this way? At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me, as though I was a bandit? Day after day I sat in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me. But all this has taken place so that the scriptures of the prophets may be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled.
Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Cyphus, the high priest, in whose house the scribes and elders had gathered. But Peter was following him at a distance, as far as the courtyard of the high priest, and going inside, he sat with the guards in order to see how the end, how this would end. Now the chief priests and the the whole council were looking for false testimony against Jesus, so they might put him to death, but they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At last, two came forward and said, This fellow said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. The high priest stood up and said, Have you no answer? What is it that they testify against you? But Jesus was silent. Then the high priest said to him, I put you under oath before the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, you have said so, but I tell you, from now on you'll see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, he's blasphemed. Why do you still need witnesses? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your verdict? They answered, he deserves death. Then they spat in his face and struck him, and some slapped him, saying, Prophesy unto you, prophesy unto us, you Messiah, who is it that struck you? Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. A servant girl came to him and said, you also were with Jesus the Galilean, but denied it before all of them saying, I do not know what you are talking about. When he went out to the porch, another servant girl saw him and she said to the bystanders, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth again. He denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up to Peter and said, Certainly you are also one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to curse and swore, swore an oath. I do not know the man. At that moment, the cock crowed. Then Peter remembered what Jesus had said. Before the cock crowed, crows, you will deny me three times. And he went on and whipped bitterly.
When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people conferred together against Jesus in order to bring about his death. They bound him, led him away, and handed him to Pilate the governor. When Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he repented and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priest and the elders and the elders. He said, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. But they said, what is that to us? See to it yourself. Throwing down the pieces of silver in the temple, he departed and went and hanged himself. But the chief priests, taking the pieces of silver, said, it is not lawful to put them into the treasury since they are blood money. After conferring together, they used them to buy the potter's field as a place to bury foreigners. For this reason, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah, and they took the 30 pieces of silver, the price of the one on whom a price had been set, on whom some of the people of Israel had set a price, and they gave them for the potter's field as the Lord commanded me. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You say so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many accusations they make against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Jesus Barabbas. So after they had gathered, Pilate said to them, whom do you want me to release for you? Jesus Barabbas, or Jesus, who was called the Messiah. For he realized that it was out of jealousy that they had handed him over. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent, to, sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that innocent man, for today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. Now the chief priests and elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. <laughs> the governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what should I do with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? All of them said, let him be crucified. Then he asked, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took some water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood, See to it yourselves. Then the people as a whole answered, His blood be on us and on our children. So he released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole cohort around him. They stripped him 
and put a scarlet robe on him. And after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand and knelt before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. After mocking him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they came upon a man from Kyrene named Simon. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his clothes amongst themselves by casting lots. Then they sat down there and kept watch over him. Over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Then two bandits were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, you who will destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him, saying, he saved others, yet he cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel, let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he wants to, for he said, I am God's son. The bandits who were crucified with him also taunted him in the same way. From noon on, darkness came over and the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, this man is calling for Elijah. At once, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. Then Jesus cried again with a loud voice and breathed his last. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After his resurrection, they came out of the tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now when the centurion and those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, they were terrified and said, Truly, this man was God's son. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Were you there when 
and they nailed him to the tree. Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Were you there when they pierced him in his side? Were you there when they pierced him in his side? Oh, it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they pierced him in his side? Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Were you there when they laid him in that tomb? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, oh, tremble. Were you there when they laid him in the Many women were also there looking on from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee and had provided for him. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. And then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. So Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn in the rock. He then rolled a great stone to the door of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite the tomb. The next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember what that imposter said when he was still alive. After three days, I will rise again. Therefore, command the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may go and steal him away and tell the people he has been raised from the dead and the last deception would be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard of soldiers, go make it as secure as you can. So they went with the guard and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone. Holy God, we lift our hearts up to you in prayer. God, we are people who have had big hopes. 
just like those people who lined the streets of Jerusalem and waved their palms and heralded the arrival of Jesus into Jerusalem, we have had big hopes. Big hopes for ourselves, for others, and for you, God. And some of those hopes have been fulfilled, Lord, and we give you thanks. We have overcome obstacles. We have achieved goals. We've seen others do the same, and and we've been able to celebrate with them. Thank you, God, for your long faithfulness to us. Thank you for the precious gifts of life, love, and, and for the companions we've found to share our journeys This morning, we're especially grateful for this community and for the other people around our our tables, longtime friends, brand new acquaintances. Thank you, God, for the ability to listen. And thank you for the delight of being listened to. But God, as we read and as we reflect and talk, about our hopes and the hopes of others, even the hopes of those people who greeted Jesus. We remember the dreams that we have had that have not come true. Each of us carries with us disappointments and others in in the world in ourselves and God, even in you. We've seen failure and carelessness. We've seen cruelty, violence. These experiences have given us opportunities to grow and and, and to respond with compassion, but at, at times, God, we have been paralyzed, paralyzed by our crushing disappointment in ourselves and others in this world and in you. At times, God, we confess we have lost hope. And so we need you, God. We need you. We need you to pull us out of the stories we tell ourselves, stories about our great successes and failures, and, and push us back into your story. Give us ears to hear the story of Jesus this week, not, not just as a tale of something that happened to someone else, but as a promise of what will be true for each of us, all of us. We need to remember the hard parts of this story, God, and to consider the role that we've played in resisting change, fearing what we don't understand, blocking, impeding what we can't control. But God, we also need hope. We need to hear again your promise that even in the darkest hour you kindle the sparks of new life. You're there on the cross. You're there in the grave. But God, you are also there at the resurrection, and we need that promise more than ever, God. And ask that this week, you would help us not only to hear it, but to proclaim it with our words, And with our deeds, proclaim it to this whole hurting world. Amen. Please stand for our closing hymn. Oh. 
Prince of Glory died, my riches gain I count but loss, and poor contempt on all my pride. For it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to blood. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet? Or thorns compote so rich a crown, where the whole realm of nature mine that were a present far too small, so amazing, so divine, dim and my soul, my life, my all. You may be seated. And before we leave the sanctuary this morning, I just um, have one other um, one other thing to say, and I'd like to invite Larry Volk to come up for just one moment. Where are you, Larry? This is Larry's last Sunday with us. Um, Larry and his wife, Gail, are moving to Chicago. And, um, yeah, I think that's happening quite soon. Today? Today? <laughs> you want to say anything about what's happening? Uh, after service, uh, Gail are, and I are going back and finishing packing the car and heading west for <laughs> Chicago. Yeah, there's a, a couple of your kids are out there, I think, right? Which is to say all of your kids are out there at this point. They so, And uh, a daughter-in-law, a, a son-in-law, sorry. Yeah. <coughs> and uh, another chapter. A new adventure. I think Leah Threet is online with us. I am. Uh, Caleb and David, is she there? I am. Okay. And I think Leah is going to just say a quick word. It, can we, I, we, we hear your voice, Leah. I don't know if we can get her picture here, too. Should I, yeah? should I talk? Will that make my face pop up? Okay. Keep, keep talking. Yep. All right. Uh, Larry and Gail, we are going to miss you so very much. Um, I just, Heather asked me to say a few words and I said, well, this is going to be a story about a person that I came to love very dearly and admire quite a lot as a servant leader. Larry has been an incredible member of the session. He has been an incredible help with the personnel matters, with stewardship and budget. He has been a huge advocate for focus. And he's also, I joke and say Larry's my assistant because I'm a big picture person and Larry is a detailed person. And he was a great team member to me in helping me take on a leadership role and helping me catch little details so that we really had as professional an operation as we could. But Larry also has a great deal of heart, public servant through and through, through his work, through his work with the church and just extreme kindness, advocacy and we're going to miss you both so, so much. And I hope that you will stay in touch, Larry, because I consider you a mentor and um, 
really hope that we can all all still be part of your family. Thank you, Leah. And, yeah. And I just, to add a personal word, of course, Larry, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for you. Larry was the chair of the uh, search team that brought me here. And um, that came at a very uh, intense moment when um, right at the beginning of COVID as well. And um, there was a, a real feeling of, um, I don't know, it was, a, it, was a, it was a scary time for me. Uh, and I think in a lot of ways for all of us. And you guided that with such a sense of, um, in, in the midst of, you know, kind of disaster, um, you, you um, kept the, the, the process moving forward and let me feel um, that everything was going to be all right. Now, whether everything was all right, I don't know. But um, you really convinced me that it might be. <laughs> And, and it has been, okay, I'll take your word for it. What a partner you have been in some, um, some really difficult times over the last three years. Um, and I know we were doing all sorts of great things before then, but in the last three years through some personnel changes and through going into COVID and coming out of COVID, you've been a real leader here and a guide and to me and Dan, a friend. And we're gonna really miss you, personally and in the community as well. Thank you for being a friend. Were you gonna say something? And, and, and I shall miss you, Heather, and I shall clearly, clearly miss Westminster. You, you have all really been a, a major part of my life and uh, my sense of mission here in Albany. All right, now let's applaud. <laughs> Larry and friends, go from this place assured that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit will be with you today, this day, forevermore. Go in peace. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.